This is Luke Katsos. I'm the president of, and founder of EMCA, the East Mediterranean Business Culture Alliance. Tonight we're going to have a special event relating to the Smyrna catastrophe, and it's an event on the remembrance uh, of, of the event. We have three um, uh, presenters. I'm going to present on the uh, Japanese uh, ship, the Toki Maru, which, uh, which was a, a ship that basically um, saved over 800, about 822 uh, Armenians and Greeks from the, from the burning of Smyrna. And it was an act really of courage by uh, the Japanese captain and the Japanese crew. And so I'm going to speak on, the, on their courage and, uh, and the humanity of the, Jap of the Japanese ship. We have uh, Peter Stavranidis, uh, who's going to be speaking on Smyrna 1922, the end of Hellenism in Asia Minor. And then we're going to have Professor Ismini Lam, the director of the uh, Greek Studies program at uh, Georgetown University, who will be speaking on correcting three popular uh, misconceptions about the 1922 disaster. In, uh, in catastrophe in Smyrna. Uh, this is an event uh, that has uh, gotten a lot of publicity. We've gotten support uh, from uh, uh, Congressman Bill Arrakis and Congresswoman uh, Maloney, who are the co-chairs of the Hellenic Caucus in Washington. And there's a lot of uh, attention on this event, and it's spurred also a lot of other events relating to the Smyrna catastrophe. And it's important to recognize these type of events uh, historically so we don't forget them, so things don't get repeated in history. Thank you so much. Σήμερα θα κάνουμε μια διάλεξη συγκεκριμένα για το θέμα της καταστροφής της Μύρνης, το οποίο κατά κάποιο τρόπο ήταν και το τέλος της παρουσίας του ελληνισμού στη Μικρά Ασία. Θα συζητήσουμε για τα αίτια που όθησαν και ενέπνευσαν τον τότε Πρωθυπουργό Ελευθέριο Βενιζέλο κατόπιν φυσικά της παρότρινσης των μεγάλων δυναμέων να εισέλθει σε αυτή την εκστρατεία στην Μικρά Ασία και συγκεκριμένα στη Σμύρνη ε, και για πολλούς ακόμα αυτό το θέμα δεν έχει λυθεί. Όλοι προσπαθούν να βρουν τους αίτιους ε, προσπαθούν να βρουν εάν ήταν δίκαιο η εκτέλεση των έξι, γιατί πάντοτε στην ελληνική ιστορία προσπαθούμε να βρούμε τους, τους, τους έτοιμους. Αλλά το θέμα παραμένει ότι υπήρχε μια σοφή στρατηγική εκ μέρους του τότε Πρωθυπουργού, του Βενιζέλου, το οποίο σήμερα το αντικρίζουμε μπροστά μας, ότι όποιος έχει κοντρόλ των δύο πλευρών του Αιγαίου είναι και ο δυνάστης του Αιγαίου. Και γι' αυτό αυτή τη στιγμή βλέπουμε τον επιθετικό μας γείτονα που θέλει να εισέλθει όχι μόνο στο αρχιπέλαγο του Αιγαίου αλλά και στη Μεσόγειο πολιτικά και στρατιωτικά. Και βασικά τουλάχιστον από τη δική μου εισήγηση περισσότερο ε, θα σταθώ σε αυτό το θέμα. Good evening. I am Ms. Mini Lam, and I teach at Georgetown University and direct the Modern Greek Studies program. I am honored to be here today uh, and have the privilege to talk about a very significant event in Greek history, about the 1922 Smyrna catastrophe. And I will be talking from a very particular perspective, the perspective of George Horton, who was the American consul in Smyrna from 1919 to 1922 to that critical uh, uh, period in history. And I will be discussing uh, the, uh, and, and talking about the three popular misconceptions that I would like to counter about that particular event. Thank you. Here, I'll explain what it's all about and how it relates to this event. And, um, and obviously, the other thing to pick up is the, uh, is the uh, letter of support from uh, uh, Congresswoman uh, uh, Maloney and uh, Congressman uh, Bill uh, Dolorakis, uh, the co-chairs of the Hellenic culture, uh, the, Hellenic, uh, the Hellenic Caucus in, uh, in Congress. Thank you all for coming. My name is Lou Katzos. I'm the uh, president of uh, 
of the East Mediterranean Business Cultural Alliance. <clears throat> and tonight we have a special program. It's our first program of the year. We have about 12 events that we're going to be doing this year. And we have about one a month or two a month. The next uh, uh, program is going to be uh, relating to uh, development design and construction. So it's the East Mediterranean Business Culture Alliance. We're an alliance, which means that uh, we like to help and work with other organizations. And at the same time, it relates to all the cultures and all the people of the East Mediterranean. East Mediterranean is obviously from Northern Africa, going into, into uh, the Middle East into Turkey and into, into Greece. Let me tell you a little bit about this event. Uh, I'll start just with the title so everyone understands what the thought process was. Usually what I do is during the summer, you know, before the year starts, I sit down for 15 minutes and I put down all the events for the year and as a matter of fact, I put the dates. And the first, the first uh, event that I put down for the year uh, had to do, in my mind, with uh, the Smyrna catastrophe. And I like to link uh, the, the date that an event takes place with something that happened in that particular time period. And obviously September is, is when we had the Smyrna uh, catastrophe. Then you have to pick titles. So uh, in my mind, uh, you know, I, I said burnt offerings. And uh, burnt offerings basically is, is what to most people. What, what does that mean? What does that word really mean? from the Greek, burnt offerings. And what is it in English? It's the Holocaust. Okay, burnt offerings is the Holocaust. So it's a Holocaust, burnt offerings. And burnt offerings relates to uh, the ancient uh, Greeks when they would sacrifice you know, animals to the, to the gods. So the word uh, Holocaust really comes from the English, the English, let's say, is burnt offerings. Whispering voices, because uh, in uh, the Smyrna area, there were voices that were heard by many people that they were going to burn the city. It, it didn't happen, in my mind, as an accident. It happened as a conscious act of what was going to take place. And it's a remembrance. This, today is a remembrance of something that took place in, uh, in 1922. It's the, ni the 97th anniversary of that particular event. And why this event this month? And uh, that's where this comes into play. <clears throat> Last year, we had an event uh, that had, had to do with the lifetimes and works of Lafcadio O'Hearn. Lafcadi O'Hearn, uh, for those who do not know, was, uh, was uh, a fellow uh, born in uh, 1850. He died in 1904. He was uh, born in Lefkada in Greece, and that's why his name is Lefkadio. It was during the time period that the uh, British controlled the Ionian Islands, and uh, therefore uh, his name, Hearn, had to do with his father, who was a British uh, uh, medical doctor. And Lafcadio, uh, from Greece, went to Ireland, where his father was, and then ends up in the United States in uh, like the 1860s. In the United States, uh, he came to uh, Cincinnati, where he became a famous author, and also uh, a journalist in particular. And uh, from there, he married an African-American woman at the time where it was illegal to, to marry an African-American woman. The marriage didn't work out. He got thrown out of the paper because he, he married an African-American woman, went to an adjoining paper, became well-known again in that paper. They asked him to come back to the first paper. He was disgusted and went to New Orleans. In New Orleans, again, he becomes very famous. He writes a whole bunch of books. If you, if you, if you analyze the name or Google the name, you'll see what I'm talking about. In America, he's regarded in the 19th century as the, as the foremost, foremost, ethnographic documentarian of the 19th century of the United States. Uh, some of his works that he, that he wrote uh, um, go into ethnographic studies, in particular freed slaves. And his, his uh, writings actually uh, supported one of the only times that, that an African American uh, got reparations in the United States. And that had to do with, with someone who is a freed, freed uh, person in Cincinnati who was kidnapped, uh, taken to the South, and made a slave, sold in a slave market. 
And after the war, uh, after the Civil War, uh, that individual sued the slave owner, and because of Lefkari O'Hearn's writings, actually, actually was awarded reparations. And with those reparations, I mean, the good story is with those reparations, uh, she was able to buy a house, educate her children who went to college, and all the rest of that. From there, he goes to the West Indies, writes a whole bunch of books, again, ethnographic studies, and then ends up in Japan. In Japan, he marries into a samurai family, uh, takes, a, you know, takes a, a Japanese name. He, he becomes a professor at uh, what becomes the University of, of Tokyo and becomes one of the most famous Japanese writers in history uh, because he wrote uh, you know, Japanese uh, ghost stories and legends. Uh, so we had an event here last year that had to do with the lifetimes and works of Lafcadio O'Hearn, and uh, one of the speakers was actually Ismini Lamb. And uh, when Ismini uh, uh, was here last year, in almost the same exact time, and the reason why we did it in September was because September was when Lafcadio died. Okay, so again, I like to link the, the, uh, the month with what happens in, in people's lives. So she spoke at the time on uh, comparing Horton and, and Lafcadio O'Hearn. And as she was speaking, as she was speaking, uh, I was sitting in that seat right there where that young lady is sitting. To my left was the, uh, the Japanese consul uh, uh, who was here because it was, the, it was a famous Japanese also writer. <clears throat> to my right was a, was a Greek ambassador. And I, as I was sitting right there, and I had one uh, consul general on one side, one ambassador on the other side, Ismini was speaking, and then she, she used the word, she said the word Smyrna. And the second I heard the word Smyrna, I got a jolt in my brain. As a matter of fact, it's in the writing over here. I got a jolt, I got a tremendous jolt, why? On one side, on so, one side was, was the, the Japanese council, on the other side, the Greek ambassador. And when she said Smyrna, what I thought about was the Japanese ship, the Tokimaru. So the reason why we're here tonight was, was because of that thing last year, basically, of the Tonki model. So, uh, and it had to do, obviously, with the, with the Smyrna catastrophe, which I'll explain in a second. So I just came back from Japan, okay, and uh, everything sort of fits in, everything sort of like works out in my life and connects. So I was in Japan for actually a, a monument that was going to be erected to Lafcadio O'Hearn. In, uh, in Tokyo, we had the, uh, the uh, Greek ambassador to Japan was there. We had the mayor of Tokyo. We had a lot of dignitaries from uh, Lafkada, both in Japan and in Greece. And we, and we did a, a whole ceremonial thing with a monument and all the rest of that. Uh, while I was there, I also uh, met with one of the foremost experts uh, or, or people who actually came out with all the information that relates to the, uh, to the Tokimaru. So uh, I'm going to discuss a little bit about that uh, today. When we, announced, when we announced this particular event, which was a few months ago, I never imagined, I never imagined that uh, what would happen actually happened. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, we had uh, attacks, attacks against this particular event, you know, the, uh, the Smyrna catastrophe. And uh, the events, unfortunately, were, were personal. We had someone from, uh, from a federation of uh, uh, Turkish uh, American societies, organizations, that wrote some extremely nasty, uh, uh, or sent some extremely nasty emails, uh, number one, to, uh, to Professor, Professor Lamb, uh, copying uh, the uh, president of the university, copying board, uh, the board of trustee members, copying uh, professors, all the rest of that, and attacking her in various ways, in terms of you know, bigot, they were talking about KKK, all types of crazy, all types of crazy stuff that were kind of shocking because no one knew what would be discussed at this event. One thing about MCO events, okay, we never ask what someone is going to speak about. We only want a title of what they're, go what they're going to, uh, the title they're going to have so we can put it on the program. We do not instruct anyone 
to go a certain way on a topic. So no one knew what she was going to speak about. No one knew her, obviously, were the people who were attacking her. And uh, with that also, we got, we got an attack on, uh, on um, uh, the executive uh, vice president of uh, the East Mediterranean Business Cultural Alliance, um, who's here with us today. She has that. She, she has that. So she was attacked. Uh, you know, she was attacked. Uh, Marina was attacked also. Uh, and by the way, when we say attack, we're not talking about five sentences. We're talking about three pages of stuff. Uh, in one of the in one of the um, attacks, I was copied, and my response basically was exactly what I said: You don't know what anyone's going to speak about. You don't know what these people, who these people are. You know why are you doing this? And then I, I said to the individual who who was doing that that uh, I invited him actually to come here tonight to to present because I have no problem with anyone presenting. I'm not, we're not going to tell them exactly what to say, what to present. Just give us, give us the title so we can put it on the program. And then when I, when I did that, and by the way, I copied Georgetown and all the rest of the people that, that were also copied. They also copied the, uh, the president of the, uh, of the Turkish American Chamber of Commerce, who responded by saying, you know, I know this organization, I know Lou. We had a concert, we had a Turkish Greek concert, so there's no, there's no issue, uh, issues there. But I think it's very important for me to bring that that out tonight, what what we're talking about, because because one of the things that was very impressive to me, and I remember I remember calling this meeting, and it was it was a it was a, it was a terrible conversation that I was going to have with her because I didn't want her to go through this particular thing. And this meeting said, I have to talk to my family, and I, I didn't quite understand. She she said, I have to talk to my family because. I'm not going to. I'm, I'm going to talk to them to see how, where we all stand because I don't want to. I don't want to back out of this particular thing because of this particular pressure. I was also extremely impressed. Extremely impressed by Georgetown. Okay, because they stuck. They stuck with everyone. They stuck with the program. And uh, again, we're not. We're not going to divulge names. Uh, we're not going to um, to discuss organizations or what was said. Uh, because I think when you have deniers, when you have deniers, there's no point in giving them a platform to continue the denial, you know, to, to, to just continue the nonsense that they had. So one of the things that we were fortunate uh, about was that we do have support uh, from many people, including our, uh, our Congress people, which is why I also, uh, that, should, that was also in the back. And, uh, and we had a very lovely letter that came out from uh, the co-chairs of the uh, Congressional Hellenic Caucus, uh, uh, Congresswoman Maloney and, uh, and Congressman uh, Villarakis, and we really thank them for this. So what I'd like to do is they did send a representative here, and I'd like the representative uh, Taylor uh, was easy to uh, come up here and just read the, uh, read the letter. Hi, um, I'm Taylor. I'm from Congresswoman Maloney's office, as you just said. Um, to start off before reading this by saying how much um, our office supports. So this is from Congressman Maloney and Congressman Bill Arrakis. As co-chairs of the Congressional Hellenic Caucus, we are pleased to write you in support of your upcoming program event entitled Burnt Offerings and Whispering Voices, The Smyrna Catastrophe, A Historical Remembrance. The horrors inflicted on the Hellenic and Armenian populations of Smyrna was a tragedy with global implications that has too often been forgotten today. Your educational program, screening both a documentary and presenting a discussion with academic experts, including Professor Lamb, is welcome and needed antidote to those who would prefer to forget, or worse, deny, the catastrophic ethnic and religious cleansing that mars the history of modern Turkey. In many ways, Smyrna is not just a standalone tragedy, but is the final act of the attempted gen genocide of Armenian and Hellenic people from their historic homes in Anatolia. We are also aware that you are presenting the program in the face of intimidation from those who deny the reality of the genocide, and we applaud your courage and want to let you know that you do not stand alone in the face of such hatred. To those who deny the actions of Turkey in the early part of the 20th century, not only wish to hide the genocide, but to deny survivors and all Armenian and Hellenic peoples their own history and heritage. 
Those who deny the Armenian genocide and the massacres of Hellenic people betray their own hateful agenda by endeavoring to deny entire nations of their history, origins, and role in making the modern world. Again, you are not alone in standing against these forces of darkness. Thank you for your efforts to keep Hellenic and Armenian history alive for today's generation and for the generations yet to come. It is vital, important work that ultimately contributes to greater understanding and empathy among people of different religions and nationalities as it serves as a stark warning about what can happen when religious and ethnic hatred are allowed to grow unchecked. to obviously uh, World War I. Uh, uh, the Ottoman Empire was uh, allied with, with Germany during, during the war. The Smyrna catastrophe uh, was the final stages of, of, the, of the Hellenic, the Armenian uh, genocide. It started around the 1890s with the Armenians first. You know, the actual Hellenic genocide was more like 1913 to about 1922. 1923, they had the exchange of populations. <clears throat> so this was the final stage of the, of the Hellenic uh, genocide. Preceding it, and uh, Peter, who's going to follow, uh, who's going to give a little background of, of all the world war. And the genocide took many forms. <clears throat> it took the forms of, uh, you know, uh, taking people out of their towns, bringing them in, uh, into, into the center of Turkey, it, it took forms of death marches. It, it took the form of, uh, of forcing people to leave the country. Uh, it took the form of, uh, of uh, battalions, military battalions, where they had uh, uh, Christians, Armenians, Greeks, etc., who <clears throat> joined the, uh, the Turkish army and they had them build roads. And, and tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people actually actually disappeared during that during that time period. After World War I, uh, you know, there was a war between uh, you know, Turk, uh, the Ottoman Empire and, uh, and Greece, you know, what they called the, uh, the Turco-Hellenic War of 1919-1922. And the Smyrna catastrophe basically takes place as the, as the, uh, as the war ends and the Hellenic forces left uh, Smyrna. That's where they departed from, in Smyrna. Approximately uh, September 8th, uh, they, they departed from Smyrna. September 9th, uh, the, uh, the Turkish uh, troops uh, and forces on the irregular started to come in. At the same time, because the, in the countryside, the people were, were frightened, a lot of people were starting to come into Smyrna. Also, a lot of refugees from around, around the country were starting to come into Smyrna. Actually, hundreds of thousands of people were coming in. Around the 10th, September 10th, uh, they, uh, they killed uh, angry mobs, or wild mobs, or whatever you want to call them, basically uh, tore apart uh, the Archbishop of, of Smyrna, uh, Chrysostomos, that was around the 10th. And around uh, September, <clears throat> September 13th to September 17th is where the major fire took place. Uh, the fire was finally extinguished in, uh, in uh, the 22nd of, of September. No one knows exactly how many people were killed, but uh, the estimates go as high as 100,000 people were, were, uh, were killed. And uh, there was a few hundred thousand, obviously, refugees that were by the dock sides, etc., that, that eventually had to leave. Some of the people were by the dock side after, after the fire. They were taken inland. The, the men, some of the men were taken inland and basically, uh, and basically killed uh, inside, inside, the, inside the country. The fire, the fire was deliberate. The fire was deliberate, and uh, and the sections, the Armenian sections and the Greek sections, uh, were basically uh, surrounded, not allowing people to leave. And actually, uh, the troops and the irregulars uh, uh, put fires all around the perimeter. Also, put uh, bombs, etc., in the in the roadways. And, uh, and the fire spread and you know, many people got killed. Prior, prior to the fires, there was rapes, there was uh, invasion of homes, there was murders and things, and things of that nature. So this is the, this is the tale and uh, Smyrna it, uh, was a Hellenic city going back three and a half thousand years. 
And th that was the last vestige, really, of Hellenism uh, within, within uh, the Asia Minor area. Within the Hellenic genocide, we talk about three different genocides, but they're really one genocide. Uh, we talk about the uh, East, East uh, uh, Thracian genocide, the Pontian genocide, and the Asia Minor genocide. But they're all, they're all really part of the same, the same genocide. At the same time, uh, when we talk about the Armenian genocide and the Assyrian genocide, these again were part of the philosophical, uh, uh, let's say, nationalism at the time. I'm not going to go into it at all because I'm, we'll do a presentation for those who want to come Sunday at the um, at the the uh, uh, Center with, with the uh, Hellenic Societies of New York. That will be Sunday. We'll discuss that a little bit uh, more in depth. But in particular, it related to, uh, to uh, growth of nationalism. And for those, again, just pick up this name, Zia Kokalb, who basically was the father of, of uh, Turkish nationalism. And the whole concept was uh, Turkification. Turkification. And those th that did not fit into the Turkification ideology had to be eliminated. People rarely talk about the philosophy behind what was happening, but it was a definite philosophy and a strategy uh, that was operative during that time period to eliminate the, uh, the Christian population uh, within what is now uh, Turkey. At the time, it was the Ottoman Empire. It was the late Ottoman Empire. Uh, you had no Republic of Turkey until after, after the burning of Smyrna and the creation of the, of the, nation, of, the nation of Turkey that we, that we have today. So the Tokimaru, I'll just speak briefly on the Tokimaru, and then I'll introduce uh, the other speakers. Uh, the reason why the Tokimaru stands out, and you know, uh, again, it just struck me as I was sitting there uh, last year, was because there were approximately 21 battleships of all the various nations of Europe outside of Smyrna while it was burning. And there were dozens and hundreds of, uh, of freighters, et cetera, because Smyrna was a major port, was a major port, one of the largest ports in the East Mediterranean. There was a lot of, a lot of trade, obviously, taking place through, uh, through Smyrna. When, in fact, uh, a lot of these people uh, congregated around the, around the port, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, uh, you know, surrounded by troops and all the rest of that, there was no one there really to save them. Many people, you know, jumped into the water. Many people drowned. Many people were killed, you know, uh, you know, right then and there. And there are certain things that stand out in my mind. Okay, the French ships did not pick them up. The English ships did not pick them up. Every every individual country at the time was only picking up people who had papers from their particular countries. But there was one ship, and the Americans also had, had, had a ship that came in. I shouldn't say there was, there was only one ship. There were some people that, that were, in fact, courageous. But the Tokimaru, let me explain what the Tokimaru was. The Tokimaru was a, a Japanese merchant ship. Uh, the captain was coming into the port, and he sees this disaster taking place. And some of the, let me just back up one second, because many people, many people were talking about being saved by the Japanese. And, and it became almost like a myth, because people would say, the Japanese saved me, and people would say, what, what are you talking about, the Japanese saved you? And it was sort of like a myth. It's only recently, it's only maybe in the last 10 or so years that the research was actually done to prove what someone's grandmother was talking about when they said, um, you know, my, my grandmother said she was, my great-grandmother said she was saved by the Jap by a Japanese ship. People thought it was a myth. As a matter of fact, I was, I was meeting with some people the other day, I said, I'm going to be talking about the Tokimaru. And he said, well, the Tokimaru, is that, was that a real thing? Did it really happen? People are saying, did it really happen? So, um, some of the myth mythology was that the ship was coming in, basically. And I say mythology because we don't exactly know if this particular thing is true. That the ship was coming in, it was loaded with silks, uh, porcelains, and all that from the Far East uh, to do trade. When the captain saw what was going on, he, he told his crew, crew people to just throw everything overboard, and, and they, they uh, with little rowboats, etc., they went to the docks to pick up people. 
The Turkish, uh, this is not a mythology, by the way. The, uh, the mythology maybe is that they threw, <laughs> they threw the cargo overboard. I'm not sure if that's correct, but that's, that's part of the myth. And uh, they went, uh, the uh, people went uh, uh, to with their, their rowboats, let's say, to, to save people and bring them back into the ship. And then the, the Turkish, uh, the Turkish uh, uh, soldiers who were there told them, told them, do not do that, we're gonna fire upon you. And which is when the captain went and said to them, listen, this is the Japanese flag. If, if one of these people is stopped, if there's any harm to any of these people, it's an affront to the Japanese nation, and the Japanese nation will not forget this and actually do something. And we're going to talk to Kemal Ataturk himself to, uh, to, to really discuss this particular issue. When they heard that, they basically backed away. And they picked up 822 Armenians and, uh, and Hellenic people uh, that they could, whatever they could fit, and they brought them into the port of Pidea, okay, in, into Greece. No one had done the research about this or really knew the facts about this. They only knew the mythology of someone's great-grandparent talking about it. And there was always this myth. And uh, one, of the, uh, one of the researchers uh, actually uh, was uh, one of the researchers. I met her in Japan. She was the one that basically went into the records. Uh, you know, her, her name was uh, Maratu. Marako Murata. I met her in Japan about four days ago. We spent a couple of hours to discuss uh, her research. And her research actually started uh, from, uh, from reading a novel. You know, she was reading uh, Jeffrey uh, Evgenidis' uh, work, Middlesex. I don't know if anybody, uh, any, any, uh, people read that book here? It's a yes. famous book, obviously. And one of the passages they were talking about, <laughs> they were talking about a grandmother, actually, who said that she was saved by the Japanese. And, and it related to the uh, World War II era because it was happening around the World War II era. And, and when, when uh, uh, Murado saw that particular thing, she wanted to find out what in fact happened. Uh, you know, why is this mentioned in, in Middlesex? And, and is this mythology or did this thing actually take place? So she started, she started her research and she uh, went into, uh, by the way, she's the only, she's the only uh, person in Japan, she's a professor at, uh, at the University of Tokyo, she's the only person in Japan who, who actually is, uh, is teaching modern Greek history. There's, there's uh, other professors in Japan who are, who are teaching classical history, but she's the only one who's teaching modern history. She went into the records, she went into the US records, consular reports and all the rest of that, and she found various uh, you know, articles. One of them was in the New York Times that talked about the tragedy. It talked about the Japanese ship. Uh, she went into, uh, again, uh, the Boston Globe had, had uh, also uh, records with regards to that. Later on, uh, you know, uh, you'll hear uh, from uh, Professor Lamb about uh, about George Horton, but also he refers to it in, in his work about, about that Japanese there. And uh, she also speaks the Hellenic language and she reads the Hellenic language. And she was the one that finally found, you know, you have the records that are in the newspapers, but no one actually found a record that actually talked about the ship coming into port. So she went to Greece and she, uh, she looked up all the newspapers that were there and she finally, she found the, the records of this exact ship that came, that came in. And uh, when you get a chance, just read this material because this is the article in, the, in Greek, and then you'll see the article in, uh, in English, which describes the event that I'm, that I'm talking about. So uh, that's why we're here tonight, okay? We're here tonight because of this meeting. Uh, we're here tonight about the word Smyrna, so with that, I will introduce uh, our first uh, speaker, uh, Peter Stavranidis. Peter and I have done, uh, actually, not about the Smyrna catastrophe per se, but uh, we've become very close in the last, in the last few months uh, because uh, I did bring this up uh, uh, in Chicago I moderated a panel that had to do with the Hellenic genocide, but a bigger picture, not, not specifically zeroing in on Smyrna. And Peter was one of, one of our speakers. Uh, you know, he's an educator, he's a community leader uh, in Hellenic uh, genocide issues. 
And he will be speaking on Smyrna, 1922, the end of Hellenism in Asia Minor. I don't know if I'm too, but uh, I think uh, there's very few elites that have the passion and the dedication of Luke. Don't you agree with that? Yes. yes. That's it. Yes. And uh, uh, when we met a few months ago, we had lunch just a few blocks from here. And uh, I was impressed. I was impressed because I saw a lot of leadership in this man. And when he told me about the topics, I said, look, all these topics are in my heart. Well, he said, if I asked you to join me, would you? I said, listen, you name the place and the time, as, it's, as long as I'm still standing, I'll be there. And this is the third time. Yes? Yes, yes. let's hear it for you. Katos and Empire. Uh, it's not an easy task on a great day like today to gather a hundred people in my hand. So, uh, having said that, today I'm going to speak mostly about this Munich catastrophe. Uh, two weeks ago, we spoke mostly about the genocide. And I have a few slides. This way you can get a taste of the genocide as well. The Asian minor catastrophe has been for many decades a topic quite unpleasant and unresolved, not, not only in the minds of the pundits, the political, the academic, uh, the dip diplomatic pundits, but also in the hearts and souls of the contemporary elites, especially the descendants of thousands, hundreds of thousands of victims that were massacred during that horrific era. And I happen to be one, one of those descendants. The demise of the millions of the Christian populations that inhabited Anatolia and the coasts of Ionia left a big vacuum which in the years to follow has been gradually developed into a very densely populated area becoming a gruesome and strategic arm of a neighbor that keeps on reminding us with its aggressive actions and intimidating rhetoric that only, and listen to this, only if you command both coasts of the Aegean, you can claim ownership of the Aegean archipelago. This is very important. And I think we see that today vividly. You agree with that? Yes? Before we even touch upon the who were the main actors that contributed to the events and the how it happened, I will start with the why. This ambitious military expedition against Turkey, a little over a hundred years from the genesis of the modern Greek nation, finds Greece in a, in, in a much different situation. Uh, Greece has undergone some major expansion from the skillful diplomatic, military, and strategic alliances against Turkey and Bulgaria during the Balkan Wars, and finds itself on the side of the victor having more than double its territory. We also have to know that besides the unfortunate incident of the Greco-Turkish War of 1897, when the kingdom, it was a kingdom at the time, of Greece lost and was forced into paying tremendous war reparations, so the damage was more financial 
and territory. Up until time, that was the only time, the only confrontation that Greece had lost. Everything else, every other confrontation vis-a-vis -vis Ottoman Empire, Greece was on the side of the winners. So that's the number one reason. Number two, the victorious powers of Antant had already decided that the disintegration of the sick man, sick man of Europe, as the Ottoman Empire was called from the middle of the 19th century. Number three, Greece found itself at the end of World War I on the side of the winners, and its military forces had not suffered any heavy losses. Don't forget Greece joined the war in 1917. And number four, the two million Greeks that lived in Asia Minor had undergone a systematic ethnic cleansing or genocide, to use the contemporary term. And Greece had a very strong motive to intervene. On the other hand, the defeat of Turkey being on the side of the Central Alliance, on the side of Germany, Austro-Hungary, and Bulgaria, during a transition period from a former Islamic empire, because Turkey is going through a transition, is trying to become more democratic with the advent of the young Turks, who in the beginning claimed that they're trying to, 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 create, uh, to create a nation that where all the ethnicities would participate, which was, of course, a big lie. So despite the proclamations of the young Turks for the democratization and the full participations of all citizens, including the non-Muslim populations, their actions aim for an ethnic cleansing that would eliminate all those non-Muslim populations. Upon these unique circumstances, it would be politically and militarily a tremendous mistake for Greece to remain idle. Because historically, it's historically proven that it's not only, you don't win wars just with polemics, with the military, but also with alliances, with strategic alliances. And that took place at the time until one certain point. And the only huge question that historians, political scientists, sociologists would be called call time after time to answer is why, why Venizelos decided in the midst of the winning theory of military operations of the Asian minor campaign to declare elections. After the signing of the Serbian Treaty, there are some, some slides from the genocide and the massacre of Kerasus, which is in Pontus, Armenian victims, 1915-1916, and of course we come to the Smith massacre, those at the point of traditional. Okay. After the signing of the Serb Treaty, Treaty, which gave Greece the Commission of Smyrna and the I Ionian Coast, look at the map. Look how Turkey has been disintegrated, has been divided into sections. So, so it gives Greece the commission of Smyrna and the Ionian coast, plus a few other territorial advantages. Why? During that time, the British diplomacy, for the first time, was considering a solution for the Pontian issue as well. 
the possible formation of an autonomous or independent republic with the collaboration of the Armenians. You see? It's right here. We believe that this hasty decision to enter into such dire straits during those crucial moments was the beginning of the decline. Who are Venizelos' opponents? The Royalist Communist Alliance. It sounds silly, but they were trying to strike a deal. The Royalists were the Communists at the time, and the new citizens of the kingdom, the ethnic citizens of the new lands, especially in Macedonia. The consideration regarding Hellenic territorial presence in Ionia is brought up for the first time in 1915 in the midst of the British proposal for Greece to join Antant against the Central Alliance. Although Venizelos and his followers are in accord with this trade-off, the political opponents under the leadership of Ioannis Metaxas, how many of you have heard of this name before? Ioannis Metaxas are diametrically opposed to Venizelos' vision, who had said clearly, listen to this, it is possible for Greece to secure its future once it is in complete domination of the Aegean. Does that remind you of something? Those words of the master politician, international diplomat. The opportunity arises in May 1919, when the leaders of the great powers, Lloyd George, Clemenceau, and Wilson of the US asked Greece to embark on a military campaign that would annex Smyrna to prevent its intended, intended annexation by the Italians. Venizelos grabs the opportunity and annexed Ionia as an agent, and Dolovokos in Greek, and Dolovokos of the uh, Allies. The ultimate result of this action was, of course, the complete and permanent annexation of this area. The gain of this action would be securing the complete domination of the Aegean being the sole proprietor of both coasts and the protection of the hundreds of thousands of Greeks and Armenians that lived in Ionia. It has been repeatedly suggested that the decision of the victorious powers to take advantage of their situation and dismember the Ottoman Empire into pieces had imperialistic tendencies and was frowned upon by some of the actors of the geopolitical scene, especially the Bolsheviks, who in 1919 crashed any opposition and took over, and only took over, but they struck a peace, peace accord with Germany, and they started helping Kemal's troops financially and military. So I, I, I want to stop for a second and parenthetically remind you that so far all the, the, the Greece's successes annexing or becoming bigger territorially took place with the support of the three great powers, but those three great powers are which ones? Great Britain, England, France, France, and who's the third one? Navarino, Russia. So at this point, we have no Russia. This is something that I think we, we, we should keep in mind because everything has to do with alliances. Uh, I think it was Papoulas, I don't think it was Venizelos, I think it was Papoulas, Papoulas the 
ambassador. He was uh, ambassador of Greece uh, uh, here in the Washington DC, probably 15 or 20, maybe 20 years ago. I don't know, some of you might remember. And he said, for Greece to go against Turkey, has to have two alliances from, from the north and one alliance from the south. And the two alliances from the north, of course, are Serbia and Bulgaria at the time, the first part of the Balkan Wars. Who is from the south? Who is from the south? What is happening now? South of Turkey, which country is south of Turkey? Syria, because Syria has been traditionally, historically, a tremendous opponent to the Ottoman Empire. And why do you think Erdogan is so hot about invading Syria and disintegrating Syria? So keep that in mind, I just wanted to bring that up. We also have to look at the different schools of thought that exist in, in the Athenian politics. On the side of the skeptics, we can definitely include Eon Dracumis, one of the most avid supporters of the Greco-Turkish rapprochement, who believed that this initiative was doomed to fail since it entailed military confrontation and engagement. His vision was the emergence of the Greco-Turkish nation in Asia Minor and not one under Hellenic domination. Megali there, that, that was his vision. That was his version of the Megali there. All these generals had a Megali there. That was his vision. That was not the vision of uh, Venizelos. However, the most serious of the skeptics was, as I said before, who? Metaxas, Johannes Metaxas, who was diametrically opposed to such a campaign, promoting his theory that the military challenges to be met could not be overcome as such an event would be an act of colonialism. Metaxas undermined Venizelos' vision and the operation since the expedition was launched and immediately sided with the Bolgevists. Initially, Kilmar's movement was not a concern either to the Allies or to Venizelos. Venizelos declared on May 1920 that the Greek military forces in Asia Minor consisted of 12 veteran divisions against the 60 to 70,000 rather inexperienced and not amply equipped, equipped Kemal's followers. Just prior to the Treaty of the Serbs, the Greek military campaign made some impressive victories against Kemal's troops. Even Winston Churchill, who was against Lloyd George's policies in Asia Minor, expressed how impressed he was with the Hellenic victories. Clemenceau loses the election of January 1920 in France, and his loss brings to power a government that is against Britain's colonial domination in the, the Middle East. However, Millerand, the new president, remains loyal to France's commitments from the previous government. Despite the changes in the political conditions, none, and listen to this, none of the main supporters of the Ionian operation proclaimed any deviation from their intentions up until the end of Venizelos political term as the Prime Minister of Greece. And these are, uh, these I have read Professor Svolopoulos to the last letter I'm sure you know the former president of the academy who has done a very nice analysis and I've had to use his wisdom to come up uh, with this presentation. So in, it is 1919 
and Hamas revolutionary army, revolutionary army is no match to the Hellenic divisions that win every battle. Since 1919, when Zelos has convinced the British to supply the Greeks with military equipment and finance this initiative, the morale was so high and the political and military possibilities so favorable that Lloyd George would say, nothing short of treason from the Greek side or incompetence that is equivalent to treason could bring victory to Kemal and allow him and his fighters to throw the Greeks into the sea. I'm going to say that in Greek. How many of you understand Greek? Tipota, ligotero tis prodosias, apo tine tuki plevras, ir anikanotitas, pu isodinami me prodosia, treason, den fa itan dinanton, na katastisi, tus turkus tis anatolias, i kanus na epidramu, stis mihi, tenaritsun tus selme stithalusa, which Unfortunately, it happened. Menizelos proceeds by sending a memorandum on October 5th, 1920, 1920, asking Lloyd George for the immediate eradication of Kemal's forces because Kemal's forces are becoming stronger. Why? Because they're getting supplies, financial or military from the Bolsheviks for the immediate eradication of Kemal's forces through the combined Greek and British forces, the immediate expulsion of all Turks from Constantinople, and the creation of a new and independent Pontian Republic that would also include Pontian Greeks that had fled already to southern Russia in Georgia, my grandparents were among them. They fled. They fled to southern Russia, to Georgia. Importers would consist of the Trapezus region, that's where my ancestors came from, Sinopi, Amasia, Tokati, and parts of Karahisai. With this memorandum, Venizelos very skillfully passes on major commitments to the British leadership, which creates some puzzlement. A mechania is the Greek word in their ranks. Despite, despite that, the British were quite reluctant in the beginning to accept Venizelos' radical proposals, and everything seemed to proceed on course and the foreign minister of Great Britain, Lord Curzon, was instructed his subordinate in Asia Minor, Admiral Sir John Michael de Robeck, to start military operations against the Mahatma. There was a tragic and very crucial detail that changed the fate of this language. What was that? Curzon's instructions did not arrive in the hands of the admiral until after three days from the elections of Athens. The new elections bring to power a government that is totally the antithesis of any zealous government. This government is pro-monarchy, pro-German, and, and certainly diametrically opposed to Venizelos' vision, who in the meantime decided to bow out from, his, from the political scene and go into self-exile. That's a big mystery. Yes, they tried to assassinate him right after the, the signing of the uh, Serb, Serb Treaty, which gave to Greece everything. They tried to assassinate him, so I guess the guy was not signed, but that's when he decided to declare uh, elections. The results were dramatic. The new government managed to, to break away from the coalition of the Allies. Ioannis Metaxas, Venizelos' most fierce political 
Opponent contributed immensely to the defeat of the Anatolian front. The defeat presents itself in the most unveiling and shameful manner through the ultimate telegram of Hunayz, who is the new prime minister, to the high commissioner of Smyrna, Aristides Tergiades, after the collapse of the Anatolian front. Through this telegram, Hunayz orders Tergiades not to allow, listen to this, not to allow the creation of the migration and refugee problem in the kingdom of Greece. In other words, to abandon the Christians of Ionia, Greeks and Armenians, in the mercy of the Turkish nationalists of Mustafa Kemal Pasha, who according to Winston Churchill's memoir, quotation marks, celebrate his triumphant victory with the transmutation of Smyrna into ashes and the horrific massacre of its Christian population. And these are the words of Churchill. And, and, and Churchill was an avid uh, advocate of Turkey's territorial integrity. Conclusion, Greece even today is seeking to find accountability for the Asian minor catastrophe. And the share of this account accountability among the monarchies, the many zealous, and the communists. One would think that these are, that these issues by now should have been resolved by contemporary Greek history, historiography. That's not the case. On the contrary, they continue to exist and prohibit the neo elites to set history straight. You're bound to hear opinions like, uh, we had no business in Smyrna. Or either way, Smyrna would have been lost eventually. However, the apologists of these views disregard the geopolitical realities that without being in charge of the Ionian coast, those Aegean islands, close by, always be in danger with a questionable future as long as our aggressive neighbor remains the local bully. We can see that clearly today, don't you? I'm sure you agree with that. Finally, one of the issues that also still remains in darkness is whether the execution of the six who were held responsible for the tragic events in Anatolia were actually guilty or not. This is still another, we're still in quandary about this. Today, with a rapid increase in economic population, Turkey has been transformed from a nation of Asia to a nation of the Aegean, looking for political and military access, access to the Mediterranean, being asphyxiated by the Greek islands breathing in her face. Unfortunately, the actors of this tragedy could not conceive at the time, at the time, the consequences of their destructive policies that caused this devastating defeat. Every tragedy of this magnitude usually ends up in some kind of a catharsis. The execution of the six, according again to Professor Swalopoulos, was the main ingredient of this catharsis. The British Prime Minister, Lloyd George, describing this tragic event wrote, every tragedy is a mixture of mistakes and misadventures or misfortunes. Never before has this phenomenon been better depicted more fully than the Greek misfortune in this war. And with these words, I would like to finish
my presentation, and of course that was the end of the Magali Vera, the great idea, as Lenny Zellers and before him other people that had that Magali Vera um, and that was vision. Thank you so much. Thank you. We are here tonight basically because of this Vigna Lamb. Because as I, as I indicated earlier, she was the one that used the word Smyrna last, last year. Uh, Professor Lamb is the Director of Modern Greek Studies uh, program at Georgetown University uh, under the Classics Department. And uh, Ismini in particular is working on uh, the biography of George Horton. And the last year, that's what she tried to compare. Okay, George uh, Horton and Lafcari um, O'Hearn. Uh, we are honored today also to have one of the descendants of, uh, of uh, George Horton, and that's uh, Steve uh, Pitkin, please, and his, and his wife here today. Um, I had to obviously apologize to, to his meaning, uh, you know, based on what was happening, uh, quite frankly, but. Uh, She's just an amazing woman. She doesn't back down. Uh, tremendous pressure, very nasty uh, correspondence. Uh, I'm so proud of her, Professor Lamb. Good evening. I hope you can all hear me. Well, first of all, I must say that I am deeply honored to be invited back to the Eastern Mediterranean Business Culture Alliance. Thank you. I am especially happy to be here and to speak about the Smyrna catastrophe of 1922 because for the past six years I have been researching and writing uh, about uh, somebody who was present and involved in the catastrophe, George Horton. And in case you do not know uh, about George Horton, he was the American consul in Smyrna from 1919 to 1922. He was present when America, uh, Turkish excuse me, forces um, burned and sacked Smyrna. He was an eyewitness. George was a classicist, a poet, a writer. He was a journalist, and he was a well-known diplomat with decades of experience in Greece and the Ottoman Empire. He was also a Christian, uh, a Christian uh, pacifist of sorts. And I'm saying this, uh, and if you don't mind, I'll go to here, excuse me. Um, and I'm saying of, of sorts because he did think democracy was worth fighting for. And as his career progressed, he also emphasized the need to use some force for humanitarian purposes on occasion. Largely forgotten today, George, except for, for some of Greeks and Armenians, for saving many lives during the destruction of Smyrna, and later writing about that event in his book, The Blight of Asia. Like Horton, I consider Turkey's abuse of its Christian minorities an established historical fact. As I believe the vast majority of scholars do, there is a mountain of evidence uh, on this topic. But for my presentation this evening, I will rely on a couple of recent sources that are particularly illuminating. Wolfram Gass' 2014 book, The Armenian Genocide, Evidence from the German Foreign Office Archives, 1915-1916, and Benny Morris and Joe Zevi's 2019 book, The 30-Year Genocide, Turkey's Destruction of its Christian Minorities from 1894 to 1924. While Gass concentrates on the Armenian Genocide, Morris and Zevi fully covered the persecution of the other Christian groups, including the mass murder and expulsion of the Anatolian Greeks who literally lived in Anatolia for thousands of years. 
By the way, the persecution began prior to the Armenian genocide. On a related point, both these sources that I mentioned exonerate the Ottoman Christians from charges of sedition, a charge often, le often levied against them by Turkish sources. Now, copies of my presentation will be available for you uh, in the end. And for those of you who are interested, I explain why these sources are so unique and so important in the footnotes. I have lots of footnotes. My primary purpose tonight, however, is to focus more narrowly on the city of Smyrna and in particular its occupation by Greek forces from 1919 until 1922. I want to challenge three popular misconceptions about those events. And I am going to argue that first, the Greek occupation of Smyrna was not an act of aggression that gave rise to the Turkish nationalist movement and led to the persecution of Christians. Second, the subsequent Greek and Turkish atrocities were not at all equivalent in scope, intensity, or intent. Uh, that everyone making those points is not automatically an anti-Turkish bigot. Now, Dr. Stavrinidis very uh, kindly gave us a rich account of all that happened leading up to the Smyrna catastrophe. But to set the stage for correcting these three misconceptions, I, will, uh, I think it will help to briefly review five aspects of the international context prior to the Greek occupation of Smyrna of 1919. First, World War I had just ended months earlier. 13 million men died in battle during that war, more than twice as many as were killed in all the major wars during the previous 100 years. Not surprisingly, the Allied powers expected a great deal in return for their sacrifices from economic benefits to making the world safe for democracy. Second, one Allied war objective in particular was, quote, the liberation of the peoples who now lie beneath the murderous tyranny of the Turks and the expulsion from Europe of the Ottoman Empire which has proved itself so radically alien to Western civilization, end quote. This is George Horton. These are the two sources I mentioned and a couple of uh, quotes. And uh, we are getting to um, the three uh, misconceptions that I will challenge. Three, as casualties mounted, the Allies were increasingly desperate for manpower and willing to promise much in return for nations joining their side, which among other things led to competing expectations by Italians and Greeks that they would govern parts of Anatolia. Four, by the end of the war, the Allies were largely exhausted and under public pressure to quickly demobilize their armies and bring the boys home by the Christmas of 1919. And fifth, the Allies felt they had to give priority to peace with Germany. Germany was by far their most dangerous opponent. It is often forgotten that the Allies had to threaten renewed warfare to get Germany to sign the Treaty of Versailles. American troops stationed in the Rhineland mobilized for this purpose in June 1919, the month after the Greeks occupied Smyrna. They stood down only when the Germans responded by agreeing to sign the treaty. The upshot of all these factors was a great underlying tension between expansive Allied war goals and their ability to achieve them. One consequence was that, unlike Germany, Turkey was never occupied by large Allied forces or police for armistice and treaty compliance. <coughs> With that background, let me turn to the first popular misconception about the Greek occupation of Smyrna, which is that it was an act of aggression that gave rise to the Turkish nationalist movement and the persecution of Christians in Anatolia. In researching the Horton biography, 
I have read numerous sources that describe the Greek occupation as a quote-unquote invasion and that emphasize the Greeks committed gross atrocities that led to the terrible treatment of Christian minorities in Turkey. For example, Isaiah Friedman's well-regarded book, British Miscalculations, The Rise of Muslim Nationalism, asserts, quote, the Turks in their wildest imaginations had not expected that the Greeks would ever invade Smyrna. Even after its occupation, the Turks remained relatively quiescent only when the Greeks persisted in their cruelties and continued to burn villages, massacre Turks, rape, and murder their women folk and kill their children, did resistance become apparent." End of quote. Well, this is all utterly false. As we shall see, it is not, and it is now hard to understand why so many people believe it. At the time, virtually all experts on the Ottoman Empire considered sending Greek troops to Smyrna a colossal mistake that would greatly inflame Turkish resistance. Horton certainly thought so, telling Washington, in fact, that the Greek mission, quote, would prove a second Syracusan expedition, referring to the disastrous Athenian decision to invade Syracuse in 413 BC. Horton did not think that Greece had the resources to succeed. And moreover, he thought putting Greek troops in charge of policing the Turks was a terrible idea for obvious reasons. No nation puts families victimized by criminals in charge of their incarceration. And similarly, experts argued, the Allies should not have asked the Greeks to police Smyrna and its enemies. The Turks, who, uh, the Turks, who despite the Greeks as their underlings, had been heavily persecuting Greeks in the Anatolian littoral throughout the war, even before they launched the Armenian genocide. Giving the Greeks the job to police Smyrna and its surrounding areas was sure to lead to conflict, as many argued. Thus, many assumed that if the Greeks had not occupied Smyrna, the nationalist movement would not have taken off and Turkish Christian minorities would have been treated better. But that is not true. And let me give you six reasons why. Pay close attention to the chronology, which I hope it will help. First of all, first of all, the Greek occupation of Smyrna was not an act of aggression. It was duly authorized by competent authority consistent with international norms on war termination and in accordance with the terms of Turkey's surrender agreement. Even so, every, everyone agrees, including most Greeks, that it would have been better to send other forces. So why were the Greeks sent? They were sent because the Italians forced the Allies' leaders' hand. And here is what happened. When Italy did not receive territory in the Adriatic it wanted, it unilaterally sent Italian forces to Anatolia and was proceeding with plans to occupy Smyrna. To head this off, the Allies felt they had to dispatch a force to Smyrna to counter the Italians. But none of the major powers, Britain, France, and the United States, wanted to use their own troops for this purpose. The Greeks were happy to go, in part, to put an end to ongoing attacks on Anatolian Greeks, in part, to help Anatolian Greeks evicted by the Turks reclaim their homes and abducted family members, and in part, because they aspired to eventually taking control of parts of Anatolia heavily populated by Greeks. In short, ladies and gentlemen, the Allied leaders had a dilemma. They didn't want to send the Greeks and knew it was risky, but it seemed worse to have to dispatch their own troops and absolutely unacceptable to do nothing and simply let the Italians grab parts of Turkey. Thus, the Greeks were sent to Smyrna. It was not an invasion or act of aggression. The second point is that the end of formal hostilities in the late 19, 1918 
did not put a stop to Turkish persecution of Christian minorities. As Anatolian Greeks struggled to return to their homes after the end of the war, the Turks were still working to expel them. As Maurice and Zevi note, the continuous efforts of the Turks to expel more Greeks from Anatolia began before, I repeat, began before the Smyrna landing. The Turks also resisted the light attempts to return stolen property and abducted women and children, again before the Greek occupation of Smyrna. Finally, and again before the Greek occupation of Smyrna, Turks continued to attack Christian minorities. This ongoing violence against Christians was relatively rare compared to what had gone on during the war. But as Morris and Zevi argue, it was telling because he made quote unquote Turkish intentions clear even before the Greek landed at Smyrna. The third point is that well before the Greek landing at Smyrna, Turkish leaders were already organizing resistance to the Allied occupation. Historians sometimes state or imply the opposite. One, for example, concludes, and I quote, the landing of the Greek forces ignited spontaneous resistance in Turkey. Ex-Ottoman soldiers took back the weapons they had laid down under the terms of the armistice, end of quote. In reality, the organization and stockpiling of weapons for resistance were already underway. In fact, immediately following the signing of the armistice agreement, the same leaders who had organized the prosecution of Christian minorities during the war began clandestinely stockpiling arms and organizing cadres. The nationalists, as they were called, also set up regional organizations called National Defense or National Rights Committees well before the Greek occupation. Thus, as Maurice and Zevi observed, and I quote, already in March 1919, two months before the Greek landing, there was a sense of impending insurrection to be accompanied by slaughter of Christians. Anti-Christian and nationalist revolutionary propaganda were rampant, and Turkish leaders mobilized manpower and amazed weapons. The Allies were steamed in their effort to collect guns and ammunition that the Turks were obliged to surrender." End quote. Fourth, the Turks could have peacefully transferred power to Greek authorities. Instead, they set a trap, thus ensuring a bloody occupation of the city. As George Horton offer pointed out, the Turks excelled at the force in order when they wanted to. For example, six months before the Greek occupation, right after the Turks signed the armistice with the Allies, there have been joy celebrations in Smyrna that led to drunken revelry and bouts of vandalism. The British asked the Turks to enforce order, and they did so quickly. A diary entry from a British expatriate lady in Smyrna at the time comments, quote, you should have seen how soon the Turks restored order. A few soldiers with fixed bayonets marching through the streets, end quote. That was all it took. The converse was also true. That is, whenever there was public lawlessness against Christians in Turkey, it was usually instigated by Turkish authorities. Yet another point that modern scholarship has substantiated for example, in anticipation of the arrival of Greek forces, Turkish authorities released the inmates from the local prison, a common Turkish tactic, and the local Turkish defense committees we talked about earlier made sure the prisoners were armed and ready to resist the occupation. They did so, ambushing arriving Greek forces and precipitating a melee just as the nationalist Turks hoped. An Allied Commission of Inquiry later determined the results were about 160 Greeks and 300 to 400 Turkish casualties. Fifth, 
The bloody mess might have been prevented had the Allies accompanied the Greeks ashore to jointly patrol the city and ensure a peaceful transfer of authority. The Allies were well aware of the local Turkish self-defense committees and the possibility of violence. They knew Nureddin Pasha was planning a hot reception for the Allies. They demanded that he be replaced as the acting Ottoman governor general of Smyrna, which happened just days before the arrival of the Greeks. He also carefully considered having the Turkish forts protecting Smyrna turned over to French forces, who then would pass them on to the Greeks. Strangely, however, the Allied naval commanders did not consider it necessary to accompany Greek forces and conduct joint patrols in Smyrna. Horton called the Allied failure to accompany the Greeks ashore for a peaceful transfer of authority, quote, the first indication of the lack of united support that ultimately caused the Greek disaster and the destruction of Smyrna, end quote. Sixth, the Greek response to Turkish provocation was not a rampage of violence, but a quick restoration of order. In fact, the Greek administration was harder on the Greeks who broke discipline than on the Turks who conspired to instigate the violence. Horton considered the quick restoring of order nothing less than a miracle, given the persecutions which the Greeks so recently suffered, particularly since it was, since it was accompanied without help from Turkish authorities or the Allies. The new Greek commissioner, Aristides Steriadis saw to the quick prosecution of criminals. By the end of the summer, 48 Greeks, 13 Turks, 12 Armenians, and one Jew had been found guilty and convicted of crimes taking place following the Greek landing. Three, all Greeks were quickly executed. Steriadis also made certain that looted property was returned to owners, Turks included. For these reasons, it is clear that the Greek occupation of Smyrna was not an act of aggression. The occupation was permitted under the Mudros Armistice Agreement, but in any case, the Turks were already violating that agreement. Similarly, the Turkish nationalist movement and its persecution of Christians in Anatolia were underway months before the Greek occupation. Therefore, it cannot it cannot be argued that the occupation itself precipitated these developments. What then explains the tragic demise of the Anatolian Christians? Simply stated, I think it was the fundamental incompatibility of Allied and Turkish visions for the future of Asia Minor. The Allies' vision was protection of Christian minorities in Turkey and the restitution of their property and family members. In sharp contrast, the Turks were committed to their policy of Turkey for the Turks and determined to resist restitution for their Christian minorities. They followed this policy steadfastly both before the Greeks occupied Smyrna and after they were forced to abandon that city. Given the clash of objectives, the Allies faced a fundamental dilemma. They either had to administer justice at the expense of inflaming Turkish resistance, or they had to let things be and effectively reward the Turks for committing genocide and continuing their persecution of Christian minorities. To escape the dilemma, they either had to commit forces to police in Turkey, which was unpopular with their publics, or accept the Turks' policy of Turkey for the Turks. As history records, the Turks were more realistic about this basic dilemma than the Allies who promoted high hopes without the willingness to sacrifice for them. Well, Mustafa Kemal's assessment of Woodrow Wilson sums it up well. Poor Wilson, Kemal said, did not understand that the frontier which is not defended with bayonets, force, and honor cannot be secured by another principle. Now, these were Kemal Atatürk's words. 
Many historians acknowledge the failure of allied idealism, but some have been quick to scapegoat the Greeks, arguing their atrocious behavior in Asia Minor was on a par with that of the Turks, and indeed, invite the Turkish retaliation in kind. Thus, we come to the second major popular misconception about what happened to Smyrna and Anatolia more generally. That is, the belief, popular in some quarters anyway, that atrocities committed by Greeks after landing in Smyrna were roughly equivalent to Turkish atrocities. This is not even remotely true. George Horton referred to assertions that Greek and Turkish atrocities were roughly equal as the 50-50 theory, which he considered preposterous. He asserted the sheer disparity in power between the Ottoman authorities and their Christian subjects made the argument untenable. Morris and Zeve reviewed allegations of Greek atrocities in detail, and, but ended up reaching the same conclusion Horton did. They found that the Greeks deported Turks, looted and torched villages, and occasionally murdered and raped. The Greeks did this in bouts, they conclude, usually linked to Greek military advances or retreats and to Turkish guerrilla operations and atrocities. The Greek soldiers who committed atrocities were often the Anatolian Greeks and Armenians who had suffered under the Turks for years. Greek atrocities were by definition heinous. However, they were far, far different in scope, intensity, and intent. In terms of scope, Morris and Zevi state categorically that all Western observers agreed that Turkish atrocities against Greeks during 1919 and 1923 were on a very much greater scale than those committed by the Greeks, their words. After reviewing the most lurid allegations against the Greeks, Morris and Zevi know they were almost never confirmed by Western diplomats, missionaries, or journalists. Consequently, Western diplomats came to believe that most Turkish charges were fraudulent, invented to offset Western accusations of Turkish atrocities. The same held true for Turkish allegations of massacres conducted by Armenians. Their words. With respect to intensity, Morris and Zevi argue, Greek depredations cannot be compared with the slaughter and sadistic practices of the Turks. To indicate the vast differences, they cite a letter from Turkish notables to the Armenian High Commission, to the American, excuse me, High Commissioner in Constantinople, Admiral Bristol, claiming, quote, misdeeds the likes of which did not exist in the annals of history, end quote. But upon examination, the misdeeds were allegations of house searches and other impositions. A quote again, there is no mention of organized massacres or mass rape or mass torture, end of quote. By comparison, Morris and Zevi found overwhelming evidence that the Turks branded, crucified, burned alive, mutilated, and stoned their victims and conducted mass rape of both young girls and boys. Indeed, these two Israeli scholars reached the chilling conclusion that the Turkish persecution of their Christian minorities was far more sadistic than the Nazis' genocide of Jews. Finally, on the critically important question of intent, Morris and Zevi found a major difference between the Greeks and Turks. In short, the Greeks punished perpetrators of atrocities and the Turks rewarded them. Indeed, as far as is known, Turkish authorities never punished perpetrators of anti-Christian atrocities and in fact, they encouraged, condoned, and rewarded even those guilty of the most appalling atrocities. After reviewing much evidence, Morris and Zevi conclude the most murderous Turks received the greatest rewards and that Kemal knew how to get the worst out of his subordinates. Turkish leaders also punished any righteous Turks who tried to resist the genocide or help persecuted Christians. 
The great disparity in Greek and Turkish behaviors was due to their disparity in power, as Horta noted, but also to their differing objectives. The Greeks were trying to make a case for their ability to govern well and thus win international sympathy for their claim to parts of Anatolia. The Turks had an entirely different goal, ethnic cleansing. They wanted to get rid of the Christians, behaved accordingly, and were successful on a historic scale. Morrison Zavi concludes that with steady oppression, mass murder, attrition, expulsion, and forced conversion, the Turks had by 1924 cleansed Asia Minor of its four million odd Christians. Their words. Finally, I want to address the third popular misconception. <coughs> Many people seem to think that anyone arguing the Greek occupation is not to blame for Turkey's mistreatment of its Christian minorities, or that the Greek atrocities are not at all comparable to those of the Turks, must be an anti-Turkish bigot. That's just not true. Ever since the publication of his book, Blight of Asia, almost a hundred years ago, George Gordon has been condemned in some circles as an anti-Turkish bigot. So ever since the publication of his book, Blight of Asia, almost a hundred years ago, George had, had been condemned as an anti-Turkish bigot. But after studying his life at length, I am convinced he was nothing of the kind. Webster's definition of a bigot is someone who is obstinately or intolerably devoted to his or her opinions and prejudices, especially someone who regards or treats the members of a racial or ethnic group with hatred and intolerance. Horton was not obstinate or incapable of learning and changing his views, or intolerant of other groups, or full of hatred. Throughout his career, he helped Muslims in need, including Turks, and admired some aspects of Turkish culture, their general hospitality, kindness, and particularly their heroic stoicism. But when Turks were whipped into a frenzy of Christian massacres by their leaders, Horton called them out for it, even though doing so effectively ended his diplomatic career. However, as I have tried to demonstrate in this presentation, the best, most recent scholarship now agrees with Horton's conclusion about the scope, intensity, and intent of Turkey's uh, persecution of its Christian minorities. In my view, best scholarship also uh, agrees with his conclusions about the comparatively benign Greek occupation of Smyrna. As a result, I would go so far as to say history, or at least some historians, owe George Horton an apology. The Turkish policy of Turkey for the Turks was a mistake, not just for the Christian minorities, but for the Turks. Turkish leaders had another vision one of an ethnically and religiously homogeneous nation with secure borders as far as their military might could reach. They realized that vision, but that does not make Horton a bigot for saying Turkey would have benefited from more diversity and tolerance. In closing, I would like to make a personal comment. Recently, I was subjected to the same name calling George Horton received. About a month ago, someone from the Federation of the Turkish American Associations, as Lou mentioned, began a letter campaign protesting my presentation today and asking the president of Georgetown University to fire me. His letters accused me of promoting propaganda and racial hatred. Happily, Georgetown disagreed and decided to defend scholarship and free speech. Even so, many who believe the evidence clearly indicates genocide took place still wonder whether we wouldn't all be better off if this deeply emotional and tragic subject was swept under the rug, so to speak, so we could let bygones be bygones. My response to that is twofold. First, George Horton lived through the genocide he described and was profoundly affected by it. As his biographer, I have to address that. But second, and more importantly, I have come to believe it is important to acknowledge genocide for
for another reason. Healing. Victims need to forgive to free themselves from the chains of revenge. As Nazi victim, Corrie ten Boom has said, to forgive is to set the prisoner free and discover the prisoner was you. It is also good for the perpetrators to be forgiven insofar as this might encourage them to do better in the future. But how can there be forgiveness without repentance or repentance without honesty about what has happened? I think that is why genocide scholars attach such great importance to truth commissions and testimonies of past genocides. They sometimes compare Germany, which was forced to confront its attempted genocide of Jews and other people they considered undesirables with other countries like Japan that committed horrible atrocities in the world wars but have not yet fully acknowledged those acts. Such comparison, comparisons indicate the world is more likely to avoid genocidal behaviors in the future if we insist on the truth about the genocides that have taken place in the past. And that includes Turkey's genocides of the Christian minorities. This concludes my presentation. I thank you for your kind attention. that we're working on is the acknowledgement, quite frankly, of, uh, of the genocide of the Armenians, the Assyrians, and the, uh, and the Hellenes uh, during the late Ottoman period. Multi-million dollars have been spent by the Turkish government over many decades to prevent an acknowledgement of the genocide. Treaties, in many cases, have been broken if, if a country decided to recognize the genocide. The United States of America has not recognized nationally the genocide that has taken place. It's problematic, it really is, because as was indicated by Ismini, uh, if these things are not recognized, if the cleansing does not take place, what happens is that it repeats itself. And we see some of the issues that have taken place even post Smyrna 1922. We see, for example, the invasion of Cyprus. And here we are 45 years after a nation was invaded where we have Turkish troops in Cyprus Hundreds of thousands of people actually brought into northern Cyprus to change the balance of the population. We see in 1955, one of the things that, that is not frequently mentioned is that certain parts uh, in the exchange of population were allowed to stay the way they were. One of them was East Thraki or East Thrace, where, where the Turks were allowed to stay in, in Greece. And in, in Constantinople or Istanbul, where the Greek population was, was allowed to stay in, to stay in. From that period of the population exchange, you had a few hundred thousand people in Constantinople that has been shrunk right now to 3,000 Greeks, whereas the population in East Thrace has thrived and has expanded. We had, for example, and we did do a program last year on the Istanbul program, where in September uh, 5th, uh, 6th and 7th, some of the things that we're talking about today actually happened in Istanbul, where they destroyed, killed, murdered. And again, the analysis indicated that it was a conscious, conscious scenario by, by the government to eliminate those populations. We see, we see here as Americans, as, uh, as humans, as people of the world, uh, what has happened, for example, uh, recently in Syria with the destruction of, of various populations, including Christian populations, and also Muslim populations, people that did not agree with, with, with certain uh, 
orthodox principles, let's say, of Islam, for example, the Aziris, some of the things that we're, we're talking about here, slitting of throats, murders, rapes, burning of people in cages, these are things that we have seen in the newspapers. These are things that should torment us, quite frankly. I'd like to thank the uh, speakers tonight. Uh, I'd like us to, we came away with a lot of information today. Uh, thank you all for being here. And uh, let's a uh, round of applause for our presenters.